There you go. You know, I, I have, I could tell you the airplane stories for the next six months. But, uh... Bob Bogash was there when the very first 737 came together. He's a retired engineer and pilot. He's become an aviation historian and helped preserve the very first 737, which first flew in the spring of 1967. That same test flight airplane would go on to NASA, where it was also used as a test aircraft. It's now preserved at the Museum of Flight at Boeing Field. And I had a, a desk, a big steel case green desk, right under the right wing of the airplane. Now overlooking the Renton flight line, nobody could predict then what the 737 has become now. At one point they sold like seven or eight airplanes in a year, you know. Um, and of course, and now they're building two or three a day. Short, stubby, and low to the ground, it was not glamorous like the 707 Intercontinental or the medium-range three-engine 727 it would eventually eclipse as the world's best-selling jet. Bogash said at one point Boeing considered dumping it. Boeing was going to cut the airplane at 400 units. Keep that in mind, 400. We'll come back to that. But the baby Boeing would go on to become a workhorse. While the New York to London flights got the glory, most flying was more like Chicago to Pittsburgh or Dallas to Des Moines. But as it became more efficient, as the number of flights between cities became more frequent and even longer, the 737's fortunes grew. The first airplanes I worked on actually had 85 seats, believe it or not. And of course, now the airplane is, flies the North Atlantic and it flies Transcon and it uh, flies to Hawaii. <laughs> The 737 was an idea born of the mid-1960s. The 737-100 and nearly identical 200 were similar in length, having those skinny engines bolted right onto the wings like a pair of cigars. It was short, 94 to 100 feet long, and carried around 100 passengers. It was intended as a short-range jet, a range of less than 2,000 miles. Less than two decades later, the 737 would change significantly. The new 737 300, 400, and 500 came in different lengths, carrying up to 188 passengers. The engines were different too. No more cigar-shaped JT-8s, but quieter, high-bypass CFM 56s, mounted higher and in front of the wings. Range was a bit farther too up to nearly 2,400 miles for the shorter Dash 500 jets. By 1987, the 737 had become the world's best-selling airline. Those planes became known as the classics, but by the early 90s, the next generation was in development, and that's what they were called, NGs or next gens, with an upgraded wing. It came in four sizes, the 737, 600, 700, 800, and 900, but by far the most popular was the 800. The 900 extended range models bumped capacity up to 210 passengers. Range increased too by about 1,000 miles to 3225. The plane was now fully capable of flying the continent. By 2011, with growing competition from Airbus, Boeing decided to go one better. 737 MAX. It came two in four sizes, the MAX 7, 8, 9, and 10. It had a new engine as well, the CFM Leap 1B, which was mounted further forward and a bit higher to clear its larger fan. And the plane also has those distinctive forked winglets. Even the smallest MAX 7 could typically carry 50 more passengers than the original 100. Overall capacity of the MAX 10 could carry as many as 230, and the range now pushed more than 3,800 miles. MAX 10 is nearly 50 feet longer than the first plane out the door 52 years ago. Since 1967, more than 10,000 737s have been delivered. Perhaps the most visual changes are inside on the flight deck. This was the first generation, what pilots often deride as steam gauges. By the time of the 737-300, easier to read screens begin to take over. And now the MAX, which should have been the ultimate 737 cockpit. But now for the first time in its history, a 737 is grounded, hundreds of those MAX jets. Boeing continues to build the 737 MAX, and around Puget Sound they are piling up as Boeing waits while the FAA decides whether and when 
to approve a change to something called MCAS, a piece of flight control software implicated in two fatal accidents of two new jets at the cost of 346 lives, crashes in Indonesia in Ethiopia. MCAS automatically changes the angle of the horizontal stabilizer to make the plane handle more like the 737 it replaced. But in those two flights, it ended up forcing the nose of the brand new jets at a downward angle. I mean, it hurts me personally. I, and I think it hurts a lot of people who work at Boeing, maybe most, all of them. But it certainly hurts me because this is my baby. You work on these airplanes and, and you, you know that they're going to be carrying millions of people. And, uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, responsibility there. I'm King 5 Aviation Specialist Glenn Farley. You can check out this and other stories on our 737 MAX playlist and get alerts when those new stories are published. You can also tell us what you would like to see in the future by posting your comments below.